So, hello again. We have to start this session. And so the next speaker is Elenia Del Popolo Marquito. The floor is yours. Today, hello. My name is Elenia Del Popolo Marquito, and I'm a first year doctoral student in linguistics at Tallinn University. And this presentation is about um, um, presents a uh, corpus based analysis of some peculiar linguistic and pragmatic choices in different social linguistic contexts of Russian spoken discourse, so Russian everyday communication. Um, oh, uh, this stuff is here, so you just point. No? Oh, okay. So and the presentation is structured as follows. Uh, it will begin with a brief introduction to the topic in order to explain which factors might influence the speaker's linguistic choice of particular grammatical form, lexical items, or communicative strategies. Uh, secondly, uh, the aims and methods of the present study will be uh, illustrated together with the corpus that I'm using for the analysis, the corpus one day of speech in Russian, which is the corpus of a Russian spoken language. And uh, furthermore, I will provide some examples from the corpus and I will provide some conclusions in the end. Um, so, uh, to begin with, there are several motivations behind the speaker's uh, linguistic choices. And the first one, of course, is the communicative purpose that the speaker wants to acquire and want to achieve. And, um, of course, according to the communicative purposes, there are different degree of communicative risk, so different ranks of impositions. And this leads us to the second point, the fact that uh, the higher is the communicative risk of a certain speech act, the uh, more uh, speakers tend to use certain linguistic forms in order to minimize the imposition, to reduce social friction and social offense, and preserve social harmony. In other words, they tend to be polite. And politeness is the second principle of pragmatics research, and my uh, PhD research deals with pragmatic uh, in particular. And finally, of course, personal and cultural specific values, they play a key role in this selection of linguistic material, uh, pragma linguistics and social cultural factors, such as the linguistic context of the situation, uh, social practice, uh, and um, the speaker's background, educational background, professional background. So they all play a role together. And also the relationship between the participants, if there is a vertical or horizontal distance, um, of course, uh, we should consider power relationship as well. Um, so given that we already know at a prescriptive level, which uh, strategies we can expect in different social linguistic contexts and in different communicative situations, uh, language in use is far from being a predictable convention, so it is relevant to investigate linguistic choices in with an usage based approach, and this is the aim of the research to investigate the linguistic choices and the pragmatic strategies employed in Russian spoken discourse. Uh, in order to perform, in this case, a speech act of request. I decided to focus on the speech act of request because in pragmatic, it is considered one of the most intrinsically face threatening act uh, because uh, even unconsciously, people are afraid to perform requests most of the time. They're afraid to uh, make a bad impression, to create an embarrassing communicative situation, to be judged or just to show their needs and their weaknesses. Therefore, I presume that in order to perform the speech act of request, they use additional, like they put an additional effort in their request. They select certain politeness strategies, indirect means, and mitigation markers. Uh, and for the purpose of the study, as I said, a qualitative research method that draws on politeness theory will be employed. And uh, the analysis is carried out by analyzing the written transcriptions of the corpus of everyday spoken Russian one day of speech in Russian, which was created by the Faculty of Philology of St. Petersburg State University uh, by means of the, 20, the continuous 24 hour recording method. It means that the participants were asked to carry a dictaphone with them for days and they were recording during this period. 
And this means that it fixes spontaneous oral discourse in various natural communicative situations. And the fact that they carry the dictaphone with them also leads to the fact that we don't have only material that concerns 128 informants, but also thousands of interlocutors that were interacting with them or around them. Um, and so I'm analyzing the written transcriptions, but I still want to present how the corpus looks like online, so the database. And this is very interesting in order to carry out researches in the field of linguistics that take into consideration uh, social linguistic factors, because uh, reading a lot of articles that concern politeness studies, uh, I wouldn't say that they take into consideration all of these factors, especially concerning language in use. Only when they like organize some questionnaires, inquiries, they might ask something. But this is very uh, interesting because apart from the gender, the age, we have information about the educational background, the level of linguistic competence, even if all of them are native speakers of Russian, the professional group and the status group they belong to, the types and place of communication that in pragmatic research is very relevant. So now I will present some examples. Uh, this is the first example, and uh, I selected this as an example of a very direct request. So we have a female leading employee talking to a subordinate employee. And in this case, she's asking to do a check to verify some data. And she says, she begins her request by saying, I have a request for you. This is an explicit performative. It means that she is not afraid to name the speech act, to name the fact that she's performing a request. And then she uses the imperative verbal form, so do, insert. Um, so the only mitigating device here is the mitigator, so please. But uh, we are in the workplace here. And in the second example, we are still in the same setting. So the office is the same, is the same informant. But in this case, it's not informant 19, which is talking, but a colleague of the informant 19 is not a leading. Uh, she's not a leading employee. She's just an employee there. And since they have to do this check that the, I showed you in the previous slide, they are trying to fix a problem here. The fact that the computer is not working properly, it slows down so they can't do this check. And basically the communicative situation is that this colleague, this employee is calling an IT specialist in order to fix this problem. And we can see that the request looks very different from the previous one. So we have um, the, the, the first question, Alexei, we is united at the boga, no? So Alexei, excuse me for God's sake, for the love of God. So uh, before the request itself, there is this avoidance strategy. We start with a uh, apology, which is intensified by this razi boga. Of course, God has no nothing to do with that because it is as an interjection. But still, we can feel the difference between an izvinite pajalsta, excuse me, please, and then izvinite razi boga. It sounds more like a prayer. Uh, so it is very intensified. And then we have this conjunction, no, but uh, after this conjunction, we expect uh, to hear what the problem is uh, because it creates the contrast. But instead of an I reference, so when the focus of the conversation is, instead of an I reference, she names another person, an external person, Maxime Skazal, as if she's trying to avoid any responsibility for the request and try to... Uh, blame somehow something else because someone else because she's afraid and not, not consciously afraid but we still kind of an avoidance strategy. Uh, Maxim Skazan that uh, so Maxim told me that you're still in Peter so I can call you. Uh, and here we can see the use of diminutives as well. So uminyava prosik, I have a little question which is different from uminya prosba, I have a request for you. And also, so it will take just a little minute. So we have, again, a diminutive. And also, she's promising, promising that the request is not a big deal. So she's minimizing the imposition in this way. Uh, but it won't take a minute, actually, because she tries to explain instead of simply performing the request, she avoids the request and she starts explaining that the computer, where the computer is located, who has it, 
and why do they need the computer for? So very irrelevant situation. In pragmatic, we can say that they are um, flouting the conversational maxims of relevance and of quantity by saying more than the situation requires, and at the same time, by saying some irrelevant information, because of course, the specialists, uh, like, I mean, this is not relevant information to fix the problem. Uh, and only after a very long monologue, she says that the computer tarmazit, so it slows down. And at this point, the specialists can actually start helping her without her performing the actual request, because she's just say, Što možet? so what can, what can be done? What can you suggest me to do? But she avoids the request completely. She doesn't perform it in the end. She just uh, gives other information. And then we have another example, very different situation. We are in a public space here and a member of the educational personnel of a university is talking to a colleague. She has a problem with the ringtone. Uh, when someone calls her, she can't hear the, the ringtone. So she asks her colleague to call her to try and see if the ringtone works. And she uses the imperative verbal form again. So, pozvani, pajalsta, call me please. But instead of just using this pajausta as a mitigator, she uses a very relevant um, strategy, the conditional form, if possible, and if you have time. This gives both uh, to the hearer and to the speaker the possibility to save their face. Of course, the colleague is not saying no, because it's not a high, like very important request. So we can say that it's no big deal in this sense. But in case the hearer wants to refuse, she has the key to refuse without offending the speaker. She might simply say, no, I don't have time, or no, I can't in this moment, instead of saying, no, I can't help you, I don't want to. And this is a work on face um, as image of the self. They are present, preserving the face in this situation. And there is no uh, vertical distance in this sense. They are colleague, equal colleague. So. And finally, I have one last example, a very, very different communicative situation. In this case, we have a young man, 17 years old, he is a cadet, so a student of the military academy, and uh, the, the setting is military barracks. They are talking between cadets. And in this case, I can say that there is no distance at all. They use very vulgar sometimes vocabulary, very specific lexical uh, lexis. But still, he decides to use a very indirect way to perform speech active requests, even if it doesn't have to be scared about some colleagues, some cadets, uh, that we, we don't have distance in this case. So he's hungry, he wants to eat, basically. And instead of just saying, do you have something to eat for me? He starts again with a monologue. Nobody is answering. And he just said, well, yes, I have something to eat, but I still want to eat again. I've been looking for food all, all day. So with this want statement, he's creating the condition, uh, preparatory condition for, the, for a request. Um, and uh, this, is, this is called suggestory formula uh, and giving hints to the interlocutors that refuse sometimes somehow to help him, they don't answer. And only in the end, he's forced to uh, make a more direct, which if we read it, is still a direct request. He says, so do you have um, to scoff down nothing at all? So there's no I reference. It doesn't say for me. The answer might simply be, yes, I do. Uh, nothing else. And he also decides to use a negative uh, structure. Instead of saying, do you have something to eat? He says, do you have something, nothing at all to scoff down? So being pessimistic and at the same time very indirect uh, with an interrogative uh, form. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, when performing the speech act of request, speaker make a careful situation by selection of linguistic units, grammatical forms and communicative strategies. And it, of course, sociocultural and pragmalinguistic pragma factors such as the situation and context, the rank of imposition, power, social distance, they play a crucial role in the speaker's choice of linguistic means. And finally, that among the most relevant politeness strategies that I found in the corpus, I, I try to show a variety of these strategies. We can name an avoidance of explicit requests, 
use of mild kind edges and mitigating device. And in general, in the previous study on the topic, everyone seems to underline the very directness of Russian communicative style, whereas what I found in a usage-based corpus is exactly the opposite, that in some linguistic con context, even when there's no distance at all, they still use this indirectness to perform the speech act of request. And in addition, some requests are mitigated by giving options, uh, explanations, apologizing, promising, and flouting conversational maxim. So by being irrelevant and giving too much information, more than the situation requires. So this was all for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on time, perfectly on time. So we have time for questions. Yes, very sorry, I skipped the beginning of our presentation. I would like just to uh, ask you, uh, could you please tell me which kind of corpus or which exactly corpus did you use for uh, your analysis? Yes. Oh, oh sure. I, yeah. Yeah, is the course was pretty, pretty one. Yes, one yes. day of speech. I know one day of speech. I didn't reach you did. As I said, it was created by the Faculty of Philology of St. Peter's yeah, yeah, State yeah, University. Yeah, thank you. And in this case, I wanted to thank my supervisor because at the beginning I had a different plan for my research because in Politeness research, most of the researchers, they use questionnaires, DCT, so discourse completion tasks, and these are elicited data, data, whereas in this corpus is natural, spontaneous data. So I would say that it's more effective to conduct an usage-based approach, and I take the opportunity, thanks for this question, to say that there are no, uh, to my knowledge, research usage-based studies on Russian requests. So this kind of would be the first with this course. Yeah, uh, please. Oh. Very interesting, and I will uh, have a look definitely to that corpus. Uh, well, we we have, and, and Victoria is here also uh, about uh, child language, uh, spontaneous language, corporate, you know, data from from corpus and looked at the requests in direct, direct mitigation strategies. And as I'm also involved in diminutive studies, so of course, diminutives are really very often uh, used in these uh, specific situations. And uh, well, great examples. Uh, and most probably you will somehow differentiate yes. uh, those yes. uh, examples and, and, and classify according to specific strategies. Yes specific patterns. In this case, the criteria was to select different strategies to show as many strategies as I could in this uh, 20 minutes. But of course, there are, there are some patterns yes. that I would so many like to... similarities in Lithuania as well. Yes. If you're interested in child language too. Can you uh, uh, speak oh, up sorry. because we have people on Zoom. Just a comment that maybe you, you as a researcher on child language, there was a study some, I don't know, 15 years ago, never published, unfortunately, by my um, students at European University at St. Petersburg on uh, the request in child's uh, language. Uh, and uh, when uh, children were playing with each other and she discovered that at around age four and five, they started to use indirect requests, uh, all this uh, around strategies, not uh, asking directly, but use, using some, uh, some questions, oh, very similar examples actually to what Lenia sh showed us yesterday. So that's also can be studied in the terms of when people, uh, when children acquire this ability to use indirect approach. Children start to use direct requests already uh, as soon as two year old. And very interesting. So it's very interesting. So any more questions? Yes, yes please. Yes. Uh, are you planning to investigate gender differences in yes. uh, formulating the request? Yes, I would like to. Maybe I'm not sure I will dedicate a particular article on that. Simply, I want to take into consideration social linguistic factors when I analyze the material. So, of course, if this influence, if there is a pattern, I would underline this difference. But yeah, of course, I, I'm always trying to um, determine whether it's a male or a female 
speaking. For now, instead of that, I noticed that there is a difference between the education. So the ones, but this is just a preliminary conclusion. That's why I didn't add it in the study that with higher education um, like background, I can see a higher use of mitigating devices, like, uh, like for God's sake, Pajalsta, whereas uh, with lower, uh, we can say degree of education, like younger people in this case, we don't have mitigators, but just indirectness. So they are more direct, more use of imperatives in with higher like educational background, but then mitigators, whereas in younger people, more indirect requests and less mitigation. But for now, it's just a preliminary conclusion. I have to investigate more in detail. Anything else? Yes, please. Uh, I have a question about the corpus. That, uh, so these conversations that are between the person who records and all the other participants, like, is it without their consent? No, I, I believe all of them knew somehow that apart from, of course, in the street where there is some sentence, of course, they can't stop every single people walking by and tell him. But for example, in this communicative situation here, um, the, the other cadets, they say, so you're again here with the dictaphone. So they know about it and they all actually make jokes about it. And this don't, don't prevent them, doesn't prevent them to use, for example, very vulgar vocabulary. So I would say that it's still a very natural flowing uh, discourse. If there are no questions, I would, well, again, this topic of diminutives, it comes up from, you know, as you know, on, on Tuesday, we already had a discussion. Yesterday, we had another discussion on diminutives. So here we go again, because diminutives, uh, they, they can be mitigating. Yeah? But on the other hand, well, this person, this uh, this lady was with a higher education. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, this one. Yeah, but uh, Vaprosik, uh, this is ki kind of, I, I think that over usage of diminutives in Russian is considered as not very educated. I don't know. So it's kind of... Uh, uh, this is kind of irritating. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. I'm not talking about what you and I think about, but but how it is perceived, because it is perceived as a like prostarechia, so low style. It's, it's more, I think, but no, it's, it's more like service, service, service style. Service, 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 service style. style. Uh -huh. oh, waiters. So the situation here, it is not, well. This is not waiter, yeah. but but I think this vaprosik. It's, it's some, I don't know. It's uh, it's funny, but maybe. Uh, also with the colleague in Russia, Maria Volikova, we just mm -hmm. uh, completely seeing and, and, and Russian communities for different purposes, adult, natural, mm -hmm. you know, data, children, child-directed speech, adult-directed mm -hmm. speech, or child speech. So there are, of course, varieties, uh, even though we, we have uh, a lot of diminutives in those languages, but uh, actually the motivation of, of using them you know, it's it's different, not very different, but there are some 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 peculiarities. So yes, this is very nice uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, described like service like, and and I remember it was like a new trend in in, in Lithuania when they started to use a lot of diminutives when you know offering food in in cafeterias, restaurants, advertising something, and waiters themselves were using a lot a lot of those diminutives. Mm -hmm. So I, I know you are familiar with the Dressler Merlini Barbarese of this morphopragmatics of, of diminutives. So there are great examples in terms of qualitative data. It is also a book that uh, we also edited together so on diminutives mm -hmm. on, on child language. But this is a lot, you know, yeah, of, of of space to 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 discover, yeah. Yeah. especially you know uh, from pragmatic point of view. Yes, yes, and I also wanted to add to what yeah. Anna says that. This is a perspective that we are planning to also analyze the perception of this request, because there are maybe people that consider that polite, but there might be people that think, OK, but just ask the question. What's the question? Yeah, because because uh, it's kind so of overdoing it. Yes. But, but yeah, yeah. Of the, depending on. Yeah, yeah, probably. Linguistic yeah. perception is also an interesting, yeah. I think, direction. Yeah. So thank you very much thank again. You.
And now we go to our next presentation. Please, Kapitolina. Uh, uh, sorry, Vlada Baranova. I'm um, so, sorry. Uh, Vlada Baranova. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, we're returning to language conduct. And uh, maybe I'm not, yeah, not so familiar with uh, Mongolic languages. Kalmyk is one of Mon Mongolic languages, Central Mongolic. Uh, it looks like that <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's a step uh not far from from the volga river but it's like um like a desert <laughs> um and i want to discuss oh sorry uh i return to to to, to uh, the title of my topic because i want to discuss today uh the result of language contact both in local russian and in Kalmyk, because uh it's typical to discuss the result of language contact only only in one language, but uh, when we have the um, situation of a uh, long multilingualism and long language contact, it's interesting to compare the result for both languages or more than both. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. So some uh, background information, uh, as I already said, it's one of Mongolic languages, uh, uh, Irat and Kalmyk. Uh, also, there are some uh, Irat speakers in Xinjiang, uh, China, or, and in Western Mongolia, uh, but they uh, split from other Mongolic languages uh, far away. Uh, and it's important that there is a language shift uh, during the 20th century, um, resulting to um, uh, to uh, low proficiency in Kalmyk among young generation, uh, and at the same time the oldest generation are not so fluent in Russian. Uh, so now Kalmyk is definitely an endangered language, uh, and at the same time, the last maybe three decades, there is um, a revitalization movement and the attempt of young people to learn Kalmyk, to acquire Kalmyk, even they, if it's, it's, it's not a family language, not on just on the heritage language for them. So in terms of generations and competences, we have um, very puzzling, peculiar situation then we have uh, the oldest generation uh, uh, with this high proficiency in Kalmyk but low proficiency in Russian not fully competent in Russia um, the middle generation more or less bilingual with like uh, balanced bilingualism stable bilingualism and uh, young people uh, who try to learn Kalmyk as a new speakers so it's not a like family transmission of language but um, um some attempts to learn it uh for, for the school from other education system or uh, uh, uh something else so my data interviews the speakers in Kalmyk and russian so i choose the language that uh, my um, respondent prefers uh and some um examples of mixed Kalmyk russian code in stand-up comedy because the performative um, act in stand-up comedy very interesting example of mixing language uh, and i want to show how how young people uh, intensively mix their language for claiming their new identity a identity that includes both russian and comic part and they try to show that they also have some 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 special uh, special language for, for it um yeah oh no sorry it's counterintuitive uh yeah uh so uh i want to pay attention both rush local, local russian and kalmyk so mutual influence uh of the languages in contact uh and describe some parallel change in kalmyk and local russians russian uh in bilingual community um so it's my also about my data um yeah so uh let's start from russian local russian it has some uh traces that are typical 
also for, for, for Russian in Dagestan, for example, uh, the M replication that is typical for, 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 for a huge area of this language contact with Turkic languages, for example. And uh, as Stoltz mentioned, it's like the main strategy of expressing the associative plurality. Uh, in Kalmyk, it's very uh, often uh, and almost any word uh, can be re re replacing and can be reduplicated uh, with change in the initial consonant, like here in Hudu Mudu, uh, like uh, lie, and <laughs> I don't know how to, 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 to reduplicate in English because English hasn't this model. Yeah, sorry, English has shm. Ah, uh, yeah, but it's from, from, from Yes, but it's in English. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But money is money, fancy is fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's exactly the same. It's, uh, yeah, describes uh, both uh, a strategy, but the, this pattern is from Turkic languages and it's typical also for Mongolic languages. So uh, uh, in local Russia, there are a lot of examples of uh, this <laughs> duplication. You can see Kapiki, Mikmiki, Dingi, Mingi, Panish, Marish, more or less. Almost uh, uh, all words can be reduplicated, uh, even uh, with some phonetic transformation. For example, if it starts from from M, uh, like mama, you cannot say uh, mama, but in Kalmyk you can say mal sal. So just this change in the, um, initial consonant. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, in local version, it's not only associative plurality, but it's also some expressing emphatic plurality and something like this. Um, okay, uh, other interesting part of uh, local Russian system, um, of a syntactical part, is uh, expressing of identity, uh, in particular narrativity, it's narrati uh, narrativity. Uh, okay, it's also from a peripheric model that already exists in Russian, uh, but in in standard Russian, Russian, Russian and other uh, regions, it's like very peripheric model. Akazvetsa, uh, this transformation like Akazvetsa, uh, it's like um, um, it, it shows that uh, there is other source of information, source of knowledge, uh, so it's narrative. Um, and it it looks like it's uh, became obligatory in local Russia, so it's necessary to uh, put the source of your information, the source of the knowledge, like in Mongolic languages. Yeah. Other part of the coin is uh, Kalmyk. There's a lot of borrowings from Russian, but uh, I skip from, 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 from other lexical borrowings, long words, and show just a few examples from uh, more syntactical system, from grammatical borrowings. Uh, and uh, there are some examples of transfer of Russian model particles and adversative construction here, the Russian uh, adversative. Um, uh, conjunction no, uh, and also the um, development of uh, some conjunctions in subordinate clause, um, some linking devices. Uh, it's look, it's not like um, a direct. M maternal borrowings in terms of uh, matras and sakel. It's just the internal development uh, influenced by Russian language. Uh, Kalmyk, uh, as other Mongolian, as Altaic languages, has a uh, complex predication with um, converbs and with other non 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 finite system, but uh, influenced by Russia, uh, it develops some uh, some conjunctions like uh, devices, some linking devices uh, like Kemal, uh, if, um, and Yungat Gihla, because. So it works uh, like Russian conjunctions uh, and uh, the, the word order more or less follows the Russian idea, and not only the word order, but also the, um, the following of clauses. So uh, uh, the subordinate clause uh, came first. 
yeah. And the second part of my presentation uh, concerns uh, the new speakers. So they have so many variation of Kalmyk with uh, Russian influenced by Kalmyk, Kalmyk influenced by Russian and so on. There are typical, there are different uh, generation of generations with different fluency in Kalmyk and Russia. So it's like um, uh, bilingualism and the new speakers, the young generation of Kalmyk, the youth, try to, fi try to find their own place here. Uh, most of them uh, can speak Kalmyk fluently uh, or start starts to learn Kalmyk not in their family, just uh, they have uh, Kalmyk as their family, their heritage language, and they, um, of course, heard it uh, in childhood, but it's not, it's not a fluence, it's a passive competence. But um, during the adolescence, they decided that it's important to speak native language and start to do it. It's a typical for many for, for many revitalizing community, for example, uh, Basque uh, and so on. And uh, in many communities, there are special terms for them. I can read this word in Basque, Basque that uh, uh, defines uh, people who are new speaker of Basque. Uh, in Kalmyk, we also have a special term, Balbil, it's also about uh, ethnic mixing, for example, uh, parents, Kalmyk and uh, mixed Russian uh, Kalmyk uh, family, but also about language. So uh, people ethnically Kalmyk speaking uh, broken or not fluent Kalmyk uh, can be called a Baldur language. Um, and it's important that in many communities, uh, new speakers um, can be can be defined as non-authentic bad speakers and so on. There are a lot of uh, prejudice and stereotypes, and sometimes the idea that they are not part of the uh, speech community, as they claim. So what's about Kalmyk? I'm not sure that I can, but I... can you help me? Men dit kun taman er mut, kun taman apat pishik mut, ender yir sechun. Офигительно это больше, юнгат гихалай, мини сосед Витя, шин машигар хулджамна. Ой-о, пишут нишкин завидуйгене, пасахозушит нарн царн ёват, надо не надо ездить гене, декат доторкан шут мафон установил гене. Ой-о, шут музыка, банц, банц, шут звуки на минимум, чтобы не дышать, шут сахоз, на весь сахоз дыхакрне. Мана хорошо интересно, кем там бодриться? О, это мана Витя Ашна. Okay, uh, so uh, those of you who can speak Russian, understand Russian, uh, even without knowledge of Kalmyk, can understand a little bit. <laughs> it's really funny knowing both languages. It's 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 a really very funny mixing of languages, but it's like. Uh, it's a language that is easy to understand and easy to follow for his followers. So even for people, uh, some students who not very fluent in Kalmyk, they can understand, of course. <laughs> and uh, this video, many people told me that it's a real, it's, it, it's some lessons for them to learn and start to speak Kalmyk. It's strange because it's not a pure Kalmyk. It's very far from standard Kalmyk, of course. But they start to speak Kalmyk and to, to hear something in Kalmyk uh, from these videos and from these vlogs. Uh, here you can see the uh, uh, Russian borrowings, Russian uh, codes. Okay, yes, and here I'm going to the... Um, but uh, really, I can... I cannot describe this language uh, as a code mixing or code switching because it's like just a natural way of speaking for, for him. And he did it intense intentionally. So it's uh, just a way for uh, to be funny because stand up as a transgressive um, genre is a, is a way to, to, uh, to, 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 do, to, to do visible uh, this uh, part of the community and their language. So it's a way to uh, describe the linguistic rights and the claim to be part of the community. And at the same time, it's uh, like funny, it's like for fun uh, for his 
um, followers. Uh, not uh, all people from uh, from the community, especially old generation. Um, um, okay, sometimes it's like they are very critical towards these numbers. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, to conclusion, so we can see that there are a lot of um, some. Um, uh some tr some traces some uh, some um, things uh not boring uh but just like like comic influence uh in local variety of Russian uh using the sometimes sometimes it's uses as uh, uh internal um uh, models like a cause of its formativity and sometimes it's like boring pucker boring but um it's a it's, it's a result of long uh language contact and the same thing we can see in Kalmyk and sometimes it's 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 hard, it's hard to distinguish uh, um uh, grammaticalization uh and development of internal development in Kalmyk from this contact uh, induced uh, development. It's typical for many language context situation. But um, my uh, guilty pleasure is mixed Kalmyk of young generation because they use all of them. They use uh, many examples of. Yeah, no, not here. Uh, he used many examples of. Uh, Oh, not here, sorry. But uh, he also uses like M replications, I said my set, and so on. Uh, uh, and they try to integrate all this Kalmyk uh, and Russian uh, mixed variety in the like mixed Kalmyk of young generation and claim that they uh, that it's, uh, it's their own language and they can speak in that way. Uh, and it's not necessary to speak pure Russia and pure Kalmyk, standard Russia, standard Kalmyk. And uh, they can use this Baldur language for claiming their our identity. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are questions, comments? Yes, please. For clarification, <clears throat> do they, I mean, speak Russian as well and Kalmyk? And this is kind of, so they are speakers of Russian as well, not only this kind of variety of whatever. Kalmyk. I believe there are no monolingual Kalmyk speak speakers. Maybe only from the old ah. generation, but mm -hmm. of course, all, all, all adolescent and young people uh, speak yes. Russian fluently. And this data is, is I mean, is taken from a uh, big city of, of or, or, or just from uh, those uh, YouTube uh, kind of places? Yes, yeah. the, the, the data from the first part of my presentation, it's not from the city, it's from the rural area when I uh, recorded some, some interviews and some text, some narrative for my spoken corpus. But this this part of this, this video, it's from YouTube, and but it's also part of the culture and uh, i often heard how young people talk in that way <laughs> thank you any anything else yes please uh, i'm wondering if you know if there are any similar developments in another mobile language Korea, which is also in intense contact with russia is are there any parallels maybe similar? yeah it's an interesting question thank you very much uh I'm not sure uh, that something like like this mixed Burat, but uh, there are some examples. And interesting is that also there is some examples of Mongolian stand-up comedy when they mix uh, Mongolian, Halha Mongolian, I mean, uh, with English. So it's a kind of, uh, maybe I can compare it. Anything else? There might be a message in the chat. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, somebody, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so why are plural and evidentiality special? Uh, well, I can speak about evidentiality just in general. An Anna Tam asks this. You can answer this, but if I, well, I can answer about Sorry. evidentiality, uh, why it is special. I have uh, some ideas. But... Uh, yeah, 
evidentiality is not a like grammaticalized category in Russia. It's only lexical category. I don't know how to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Where is a video for for answering Tom? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, and it's grammaticalized. So we have special affix in Kalmyk mm -hmm. and obligatory in Kalmyk. And in local Russia, we can see the, 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 the way, the strategy, when the um, lexical marker of uh, narrativity um, became uh, obligatory. So it's kind of grammaticalization. Uh, and uh, so there was a general, Anna, can you hear me? So there's a general thing also, so, so about uh, why evidentiality is, it's kind of salient. It is, uh, yeah, it is uh, uh, often uh, borrowed because it's semantically prominent. You know, when you structure your narrative, so where are you, this information, where it comes from, are you sure, or you've just heard it, or you haven't witnessed it, but it is logical to suppose uh, and so, so uh, and so, so on. So, uh, this uh, there are studies why uh, Turkish uh, Mish suffix. Yeah. So this is non-first hand evidentiality. Why it is borrowed into you know varieties of uh, well other other languages that are in contact with Turkish and so on and so on. So it's a general thing. Uh, about plurals, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, speaking about evidentiality, we have two understanding. First, like typological point of view, when we, of course, every language has um, the, the, the possibility to express uh, the source of knowledge. But also, there is languages with evidential marker. Uh, so this is, it's kind of compulsory. Yeah. It's yeah, obligatory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, if not, there is one thing I would just, well, I, I, I can discuss your, pre thank you very much, I can discuss your presentation for hours and hours because I've made so many things, but one thing, how to label this, uh, well, this way of speech, yeah, so how this young man uh, presented it. Uh, you can probably look into uh, this model by our fused lects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fused because it looks it, very yeah. much like yeah. this. And I've seen similar examples from other languages uh, so as, as, as well. So it is either obligatory, just the fact of mixing, and it, it is non-marked because it's, it's, for, it, it's usual for this genre, for this register. So it can be a register as you describe, and it can be also just, Everybody speaks in that way in yeah, the time. Yeah. So maybe it is uh, this. Another thing is maybe you can look into, well, I'm not sure whether it applies here, but uh, again, our and co-authors have written about um, language fusion. So yeah. there are various yeah. gradations mm -hmm. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there is a uh, the, the second idea is better, but maybe I'm confused like the strict idea because it's like just uh, the process and the continuum because this guy, of course, is a extreme extreme case mm -hmm. he tried to, to to be fun for to, to create a funny video so yeah, yeah, but, but, well we can discuss it later I yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you very much again and so now the next presentation is by Kapitalina Fyodorova and Natalia Chulkina Thank you. Uh, so today we'll talk about our pilot project. We started it uh, recently. Uh, linguistic landscape studies started uh, some year and a half ago, and uh, uh, soundscape study we started only this spring with our students. So uh, it's just a very, very novel, more about how we do it than what we already got. Uh, the results are very preliminary, it's just more about what we plan to do. Uh, but our idea is to uh, get a 
as we <laughs> try to show, sort of multi multimodal, multi dimensional uh, description of uh, multilingualism in Tallinn uh, to approach it from. Uh, at least two different uh, dif di different uh, approaches, uh, ways. So, so uh, just some very, very basic facts about uh, multilingualism in Estonia. Uh, of course, as you, I'm sure, know, uh, all the, 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 the very history of uh, Estonia as a country uh, can be described described also in terms of linguistic influences from uh, different uh, forces uh, coming to this land uh, during the centuries, and uh, there were of course uh, huge uh, German influence uh, for quite a long period, and then Russian, and uh, in several stages, uh, Russian Empire, and then. Uh, interwar period of uh, independent Estonia with, with a rather small Russian-speaking minority. And uh, again, after the occupation uh, and the uh, creation of the Soviet Estonia, of course, there was a mass migration of Russian speakers from all over the Soviet Union from with uh, uh, sometimes with different also ethnic languages, but also Russian, speak Russian speakers, fluent Russian speakers, and uh, officially language policy was bilingual, but in fact, Russian had a dominant position. And uh, this bilingualism in many cases was unidirectional. So uh, Estonian speakers were obliged uh, to learn Russian while Russian speakers could do without Estonian. Uh, and. Uh, of course, after 1991, the roles uh, of majority and minority, uh, not in uh, terms of quantity, but in terms of this dominance, they uh, had been reversed, have been reversed. And uh, uh, of course, now we have quite a uh, complicated situation, as uh, also in other post-Soviet countries, uh, with uh, Russian, uh, Russian speakers still uh, making a significant part of the society. And uh, uh, of course, multilingualism nowadays in Estonia is a uh, uh, of new norm. Uh, people are expected to use uh, the, uh, Estonian and uh, also English for especially for younger people and uh, for Russian speakers, uh, their native language Estonia and so on. So uh, uh, everywhere, almost everywhere, we uh, have these uh, three, what we call big languages, Russian, Estonian, uh, English, and Russian. But what actually happens with all other languages and how these languages are distributed, that's actually the um, purpose of our study. Yes, and we started this uh, to study the diversity actually of uh, Estonian mother tongues, and this uh, this is statistics from the last census in Estonia, two thousand twenty one, and now we can see that actually there are quite a lot of uh, different mother tongues that are spoken, or at least they are documented by uh, people themselves according to their uh ability house but the, the the largest language is estonian russian and ukrainian they are very different for example ukrainian under ukrainian it's, uh, 12, around 12000 and under russian it's around 390000 people speaking estonian is around 900000 speakers so that they are very different but comparing to other uh censuses which uh, the first one was in uh, 2000 and there were only 100 109 languages in uh, census uh, 2011 it was uh, 157 and now here we can see that the two, uh, 243 uh, mother tongues in estonia and this almost doubled number doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's really doubled during the last 10 years, but uh, I think that the matter is in the statistics, in the met method of gathering statistics, because uh, 10 years before, uh, it, you could choose only one mother tongue, but in the last statistics, you could choose more than one mother tongue, and so it, I think that here are quite a lot of bilingual, maybe trilingual uh, people, and th that's the point. And if you see uh, the next slide, uh, it's, uh, it shows that... Uh, uh, there is a growing number of uh, foreign language speakers in general, and particularly those who uh, speak English as foreign language. It's 40, 
eight uh, percent people who knows English, and also a quite gross of number of uh, Russian as foreign language speakers, and it's around uh, 39 percent. However, this number grows down comparing to previous censuses, as you see. And uh, from the table, you can see that uh, in uh, in the year 2000, 2011, there were more Russian speakers than uh, English, English speakers, uh, while now the situation is quite opposite. And Estonian also grew slightly, as you see, uh, up to 17%. Uh, however, uh, Finnish is spoken more rarely. Uh, German also speak, is spoken at the moment more rarely. However, other language, other foreign languages are, are growing at the moment, comparing to the Grosso ones, and the the next uh, next slide shows how this a cumulative uh, table, and it shows the general number of languages uh, language speakers, both native and foreign. Estonian is spoken by forty eight percent of uh, both mother and uh, foreign language. Uh, Russian is spoken by 67% of uh, people, 29% uh, mother tongue, and 38% uh, uh, foreign, foreign language. And the Russian language prevails in the group, in the age group, plus, uh, 15, 50 plus, as you see in, in this table. Uh, uh, however, uh, in the, English, uh, the English language, uh, which is the next one, now, it, it is mostly spoken in younger generations, and it forms 47% of uh, foreign language speakers in Estonia. Finnish is more spread, as, we, as you see, also among, let's say, middle-aged and older people, maybe <laughs> thanks, to, <laughs> thanks to Finnish television, which <laughs> they used to, to watch during Soviet times. <laughs> and, uh, of course, a, a lot of people had uh, also working experience in Finland, and I, I, I think but. Of course, we, we didn't study this, this question, why they speak language in, in these groups. In, anyway, uh, that's the statistics. So it's, it's very diverse, actually, here in Estonia. Uh, and we wanted to study it more yes. thoroughly. What, is what, 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 what actually happens in real life? Uh, and uh, so multilingualism, of course, is widespread, and uh, especially in Tallinn and in the capital, uh, because there are a lot, of course, a big expat community here, and uh, also children study uh, learn foreign languages at school. And uh, uh, of course, these three big languages, Estonian, Russian, English, can be found everywhere uh, on the website of. Uh, almost every company and also governmental websites, digital screens, applications, almost everywhere you can choose between, at least between those three languages. And um, at the same time, well, this is just an example. Of course, uh, if you need to uh, go to the governmental site, you can, you can choose your language there or application by some supermarkets. Uh, and for example, um, uh, in most places where you, if you go to uh, dine out, uh, in menus you find more languages than one. It's quite a rare thing that you have menu only in Estonian. And in this small study, uh, students of my course uh, conducted two years ago, they studied menus of different uh, restaurants uh, in Tallinn, and they discovered uh, this proportion of language use. Again, Estonian, most of all, then English. English is uh, so sort of uh, presence of English is bigger in menus than Russian, for example, but also some other languages. But uh, in most cases, uh, apart from Finnish, all other languages they are used exclusively in the uh, ethnic restaurants. So in Italian restaurant, you will find Italian and Japanese, Japanese, and so on, but not for uh, including uh, the audience. And uh, uh, what we, uh, uh, that's just uh, started this collection of menus, but then um, uh, we started the project on uh, studying uh, language uh, Linguistic landscape, uh, studying linguistic landscape, collecting all the data on the uh, visual use of language, uh, different languages uh, in public spaces, uh, where we can see how different languages are distributed, especially uh, in different spaces, and uh, how they are uh, placed 
in one side, one side, for example, how if they are equally distributed and so on. And uh, to do that, we use um, uh, methods uh, developed by uh, at uh, the University of Manchester by uh, already mentioned here Yaron Matras. And uh, uh, they uh, created a special uh, tool uh, called uh, LinguaSnap. Uh, it's a mobile application uh, which permits anyone, any user to make a digital photo, uh, which also gets immediately GPS coordinates for the photo taken. And uh, then it is placed on the digital map, but also uh, different metalinguistic information is collected, uh, such as number of languages, uh, uh, translation, uh, uh, alphabets used, uh, position of the sign, uh, nature of the sign itself and uh, its content and uh, how is it used and so on. And all that is uh, can be found on the map. And we uh, localized uh, the same uh, methodology and uh, now we have this website and the mobile application anyone can download and use. And everyone are welcome, of course, to do it. Uh, and uh, we have this uh, multilingual Estonia. It covers all Estonia, not only Tallinn, but now we are focusing on Tallinn. Uh, and uh, every spot is a, a photo, uh, like this one, for example. Uh, and uh, we can see image itself. We can see information uh, where um all this meta linguistic information is uh, listed and it it can also be used uh, to sort between images and uh, for example find all the images on using chinese or all the images uh which are graffiti and not print and science and so on uh and also it's possible to have a street view uh another option so even if you are never been to Tallinn, for example, you can see uh, what it looks like around this sign, uh, how it's placed in the context of the of this urban context. So yes, this is the uh, this information, and uh, uh, again you can see the it's street view. So uh, and if you look at this sign, for example, uh, sign itself. Of course, we see here again uh, Russian and English and Estonian. Uh, they are not totally duplicating each other, more complementing each other. Uh, in this case, and the open sign only in English. And also, we can see some Latin in the uh, in this barrelia. Uh, 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 on the house. So again, it's a composition of different languages in one sign. And uh, of course, we can also study, study, see different, uh, uh, different regions of the city in terms of different language use. Okay, yes, second part. <laughs> At the moment, uh, we have the study on language use in soundscape and we have four students who uh, conducted under our supervision this, this research, they uh, use uh, very language, uh, very rapid language observation uh, with special, uh, they just record uh, the number of participation, their gender, their approximate age, because they're not questioning them, they're just observing them. And uh, the language of uh, each participant, what language they, they use, and the, if it is needed, they make also some notes, some extra notes, or some comments uh, on the situation, what they, they are viewing at the moment. And uh, with the with a discussion with us, they decided where to stay, where to conduct their observation, and uh, agreed on uh, corridors of Tallinn University, theaters and concert halls, uh, shopping centers in different districts of Tallinn, uh, markets in different districts, and they also they uh, pay attention to different times. For example, are they working hours or they are weekends and, and so on. And they, they try to really to uh, look for different districts, like uh, mostly Russian speaking district in Lasnama or mostly Estonian speaking district in Nima, for example. And uh, can you 
the other slide, yes. They, uh, to make it more uh, convenient, uh, they agreed on a special form, which is in their mobile telephone, and they just have to tick different uh, Google Forms. And uh, it, it is also very convenient because after that, this, uh, this Google Form just gets all together in an Excel document, and then the, it, it is very easy to, uh, to collect the data and to count all, how many. Huh? how many languages and what languages they use. So we try to use uh, some more or less which are, which can be spread here in Estonia. But uh, practice shows that of course, uh, mostly they hear Estonian, Russian and English language and with some inscriptions of, uh, of other languages. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, we also asked them to, to look at the visual landscape in the places where they observe soundscape. And uh, here we can, uh, we wanted to show that it is not very consistent. Uh, as soon as they are in the Russian theater, for example, of course, uh, they, they hear mostly Russian language speakers there inside, but the visual landscape shows uh, different languages <laughs> in use and mostly in use, of course, mostly Estonian. And uh, the reason we can, uh, we know the reasons, of course, the, uh, the language lore, and maybe even the target, the target group, because, uh, for example, the Russian theater uses this synchro synchronized uh, translation into Estonian. And so any Estonian resident can, with the knowledge of Estonian, can come to the, uh, to the Russian theater and uh, see uh, the Russian the performance in the Russian language. Uh, and uh, it's, it's also a target group, not only uh, the language, uh, the, the, law, the language law, but also a target group. And here in, in the center, we can see that actually it's Rockwell Theater that uh, takes the premises of the Russian theater for their performances here in Tallinn. And uh, the target group, of course, those who speak Estonian, because for example, these performances are not translated into, into the Russian language. However, that they take place in, in the Russian theater. Uh, but Castle, of course, in the Russian language, because it's the Russian theater, yes, and, <laughs> and it was traditionally, yes, and here in the center, uh, not everything is doubled, as, as we see here, uh, because the name of the uh, of the play is translated, is in two languages, but the, the names of the authors only in Estonian, or maybe not Estonian, of course, their origin, <laughs> and, uh, and that's it, that's the visual landscape, and now we can go to our conclusions. Yes. So, uh, so uh, we are uh, in this in this soundscape study. We are uh, in the very beginning, but uh, now we have some preliminary preliminary data and uh, preliminary figures. Uh, again, the uh, the idea is to do consistent research. So. Uh, the, the the exact number of hours spent in one place should be uh, done in the second place and so on so they, they could be compared and um, also what we uh, discover of course is that this soundscape is uh, different in different places and in different uh, time periods also and uh, uh, this uh, there can be in many in place, the, there is a mismatch between visual and audio landscapes. Uh, the same uh, you can witness, for example, in uh, some shopping malls in Lasname, where you can hear only Russian, but uh, if you look around, you will see mostly signs in Estonian. So this uh, linguistic landscape, visual landscape, uh, doesn't necessarily reflect uh, actual uh, language use. Uh, and uh, cannot predict it in this sense. Uh, and uh, uh, there are certain, uh, both in terms of spatial and temporal distribution, there are certain language bubbles that can be discovered in Tallinn where most communication is done in one language. Uh, These uh, examples from uh, Russian theater or uh, Las Name Centrum, they are obvious, but also there are bubbles, uh, like Estonian bubbles, English bubbles, and so on. And uh, uh, this, they can also be not uh, spatial, but temporal. In uh, some cases, uh, the time of day matters, as I discovered during one uh, very interesting, interesting uh, 
uh, field work uh, in uh, during the night with uh, our colleague who visited us um, from from Germany, and um, uh, we uh, conducted observation and interviews one night in Tallinn in uh, different places that work at night, like uh, night shops and uh, night uh, uh, pharmacies working at night and so on. And uh, what we discovered, for example, in the pharmacy in Lasname, in interview with the um, pharmacist who, who works there, that uh, during the day, uh, most customers, 99% of customers use only Russian, are Russian only uh, during the day. But during the night, it's there are only two uh, pharmacies in Thailand working during the night. So all kind of people come to his uh, to his place. And, uh, and uh, so uh, communication is conducted in three languages, not in one during the night, but not during the day. So that's again, temporal, temp temporal bubble. So combining these two approaches to studies, uh, as we hope will let us to present this multidimensional image of uh, uh, of the city of Tallinn and uh, will uh, open the way to more in-depth linguistic analysis of the data, which we plan to do also, of course. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much. Have question. Yes, please. Um, Thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, I have done some similar kind of research projects with my students. And uh, I wanted to ask you about the limitations of using this data of really talking about the, the results in the uh, from the point of view of linguistics. Mm -hmm. Because um, the students might just not recognize the languages they, they hear, and then they are I don't know embarrassed, and then they just don't tick the boxes, uh, or uh, they get tired and and wanna have a break, and so they don't take any more pictures. But actually, there, there are more. So uh, and also, if you have many texts on one. Uh, Photographs. So, how you how do you count that, and, mm -hmm. and how do you uh, tell the students to count that? So, all kinds of questions that I uh, encounter that made me, as a result, to interpret the the students' um, projects simply as a, an effect of their learning. But I am I didn't use it to say that uh, that's how things are because I'm not so sure that mm -hmm. we did everything like uh, by the book. So how did you approach it? Uh, thank you. That's a brilliant question, I think. And of course, it's a sort of compromise, uh, uh, as we all know. And uh, especially in um, this linguistic landscape study, because it relies on crowd, crowd crowdsourcing and uh, on engaging people uh, to do the research who are not researchers themselves. Of course, uh, it's uh, not not always reliable, but in, in the case of linguistic landscape, it's easier because uh, even if they are not uh, attribute languages correctly, you can make a recheck. And uh, because, of course, uh, p uh, images are not placed on the map immediately, there is a first day, first should be checked and approved by moderator. And also, moderator uh, adds some uh, a lot of extra information which can be derived from images itself. In most cases, you can do it, and uh, if uh, there are several signs in one picture, uh, we actually, we don't use it for this kind of data. We don't, do not use exactly for quantitative analysis. It's more for what Blomberg called ethnographic linguistic landscape analysis to analyze each sign as a sort of speech act and uh, how it's uh, engaged with the context. With soundscape studies, of course, we cannot control. <laughs> The students, so uh, our main, I would say, our main answer would be to sort of uh, educate them well and uh, try to persuade them in the importance of what they do and uh, importance of research ethics and so on and uh, uh, and the 
tell them explicitly that if you do not understand something, they, it's better they use comments for that. Like uh, some language we cannot recognize, they just tick other language and uh, under question mark writes like Chinese or something and so on. And also, uh, we ask them not to be tired. Actually, they are not very long time uh, listening like to the soundscapes. They, they come many times in different days for a short period of time. So it's more or less like... Mm -hmm. There is a, a remark here, I'm sorry, on, on Zoom. Anne Tam writes, great talk. Thank you. Good luck. Greetings from a similar project of languages of Budapest and Vienna. Do come <laughs> over to give a talk on your project. <laughs> Carol University. Thank, thank you. you. We'll definitely come. Yeah, thank you, Anne. You are very, you're very kind. Yes. Thank you so much. Budapest. Yes. <laughs> so any anything else? Yes, please. Just uh, a comment about uh, this certain mismatch between visual and audio landscapes. It's uh, just uh, due to uh, language regulations in Estonia, due to our language law that uh, requires that uh, what concerns the official uh, linguistic landscape uh, to be in uh, the national language. And uh, thus, it's quite understandable that uh, they are. No, but but the, the law doesn't uh, forbid to use other languages, right? Uh, no, no, they can be they can be included uh, in any number if the, the same information is presented in Estonian and not in a smaller letters and so on. So of course it explains why Estonian is there, but it doesn't explain why other languages are not there, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to ask: Have you published anything already in this topic? Uh, not yet, not yet. We plan, of course, the very not beginning. Yet. Just also one question for clarification, because when you showed those uh, surveys or whatever, those apps, mm -hmm. and there were languages listed, and one by one, but uh, we know that these are kind of bilingual, trilingual, uh, you know, um, signs, and therefore I think it's important also not to be misleaded, that these are kind of signs with not necessarily monolingual signs, when you see like Estonian, uh, English, etc. So it, it it looks, you know, from the first kind of mm -hmm. impression that these are monolingual in those specific languages, but actually these signs are mainly, you know, multilingual. Well, they because uh, they are what we call uh, hybrid signs, uh, digital signs. Actually, uh, Vlada and I were writing an article about it with another uh, co course uh, on, on digital signs uh, on. Uh, uh, when uh, how they uh, this multilingualism is uh, uh, transforming uh, as a result of this use of possibility of choice of choosing your language when you have one screen and then you just uh, choose your language and then it's all monolingual in one language but uh, you have the possibility there so that's uh, in uh, in this uh, case, uh, this multilingualism is not sometimes not obvious. Uh, you go to the website, you see it's all in Estonian, but you know that you should look for some uh, switch to, to change the language, right? And uh, it's just like an opportunity. Mm -hmm. that all the signs are multilingual and only one of those languages will be present there. Is it mm, well after you after you change it yeah. you have to say, yes everything kind of will be uh, well not not sometimes not sometimes not not everything not everything is uh, translated and uh, of course in most cases but well in many cases they are totally parallel like we have to finish so, um, yeah. so thank you very much we have a coffee break uh, and we reconvene at 15:35 the same day uh, now we'll turn to Thai language, and we have, we'll have two presentations on uh, first language acquisition. And the first presenter is Piet The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm a PhD student at Tallinn University. And uh, first, I will give a very short overview of the use of space theory, as it uh, will be important for some conclusions I make based on my study. Um, I will uh, present my research questions, go over the data and participant of my study, 
and uh, share my results and then talk about some of the implications of my study. Um, so the usage-based theory, um, it has become quite popular recently, and it has also gained uh, popularity amongst the researchers who study child language acquisition. Uh, usage-based theory, it challenges the poverty of stimulus claims. So uh, UB theorists say that children, children are able to extract linguistic knowledge from the input they hear, uh, and they learn uh, from the input. So they use cognitive learning mechanisms like analogy, imitation, intention reading, pattern finding, and uh, this is what helps them to learn language. Children build up their language uh, piece by piece from the input they experience. And uh, uh, also uh, the input they experience and also the output they produce themselves are both important. So according to usage-based theory, the language learning is very much input dependent. And uh, child-directed speech, which has been found to be very repetitive, is also what helps children to learn uh, or acquire language. Um, during language acquisition, certain constructions become entrenched. Some are more entrenched and other constructions are less entrenched. Um, so according to usage-based theory, uh, the language learning develops along a continuum of uh, varying complexity and different levels of abstractness. So children start out with some lexically specific uh, units or frozen chunks. Um, these can be words, morphemes, or combinations of them. Um, and through input and usage, then children move on. They start forming partially schematic units or frame and slot patterns. So for example, they have initially a fixed chunk, they know how to say, I want candy. Uh, and in the process of language learning, then they learn to replace that candy with another word. And then it's a partially schematic unit where the I want uh, X is the frame and the slot is that X. And into that slot, they initially uh, put words that are similar to candy. And then over time, they put uh, different words that are not so close to candy. And also then they move on and they learn to replace I with something else and, and, and so on. So it goes piece by piece, step by step um, and we, until they then reach adult-like grammar. Um, also those more specific units uh, are easier for the speaker to re retrieve um, as they're cognitively less demanding. So, and this is why those uh, fixed chunks and uh, frame and slot patterns are important because um, they, uh, they are easier for the child to use when they're learning still their language. Um, and these uh, frame and slot patterns and fixed chunks have been found to be frequent uh, in early speech. Um, and this is then the place also where the child builds up their language and learns. Um, and they increase the complexity and also their utterance length that way as they add to those pieces. Um, and there has been a method to, to uh, method developed to learn those uh, or figure out what are those patterns that children use. Um, and I went out to study uh, those patterns and uh, I came up with three research questions. So what proportion of code mixed utterances can be accounted for with the help of constructional patterns found in the child's monolingual data and the caregiver's input? And second, to what extent do the patterns in the child's output overlap with patterns attested in the input? And which constructions in both languages attract co-mixing? Um, so uh, I collected 46 hours of data uh, from then an Estonian English bilingual child. Um, I recorded uh, spontaneous speech during play and snack times. The recordings took place while the child was two years, three months to two years, 11 months old. And the family uses a family language policy where they separate the languages by days. So on three days a week, they speak Estonian. Four days a week, they speak English. And since they reside in Estonia, then it sort of almost evens out the language balance because there's more language also coming in in Estonian on those English days. So it's fairly balanced, I'd say. And occasionally also older siblings were present for the recordings. Um, 
the parents themselves do not really co-mix uh, during the interactions with the child, but uh, the older siblings do to some extent. Um, now, moving on to the traceback method. So um, the aim of the method is uh, to show how the child's utterances are related to his or her own utterances or then to the caregiver's previous utterances. It was developed by Levin, Fearens, Spears, and Tomasello, and Dabrowska and Levin in the early 2000s. Um, the method can help establish uh, that children learn language item by item in a piecemeal fashion, just like the usage-based theory claims. Um, and also the method shows us which are the patterns that the child uses. Um, so for this reason, you need a, or you need a longitudinal corpus of child speech. And uh, it is divided into two parts. So there's the bigger main corpus and then a smaller test corpus. The test corpus is usually taken from the very last recording session or two. And then you start taking the utterances from the test corpus and trace them back to the main corpus. Um, yes. So there have been over the years, uh, different uh, operationalizations used, but the main idea has been the same. So I used a computational implementation uh, done by Quick and Hartman 2021. Uh, the positive side of the computational one is that it allows you to look at bigger data set. As you can imagine, if you have 30, 40, 50 hours of data and you try to do it manually, you take these utterances, you look through all of the rest of the utterances, it's very time consuming. So hence the computational implementation. Um, Yes, so uh, this is how the traceback method works. So first for each utterance in the test corpus, it checks whether there is, there is a verb of the match in the main corpus. If there is a match, then the derivation is considered successful. Uh, if there is no match, then um, you start looking whether there's a frame and slot pattern found in the main corpus. Um, so for that, uh, there's two consecutive words are replaced by a wildcard in the search ex expression. So uh, for example, if our target utterance is Mina ate the cornflakes, so I do not want cornflakes, then it looks for all of these different. So uh, it looks for all of these different ones. And if they're tested at least twice in the main corpus. Um, so thereafter, the algorithm checks if the omitted words are also tested in the main corpus. And if this is the case, then the pattern candidate is considered valid. And if there are multiple pattern candidates that are found to be valid, then uh, the longest consecutive fixed strings are preferred. Now, I did three different analyses. First, um, I took the child's code mixed utterances and I traced, so my test corpus was all of the child's code mixed utterances and I traced <laughs> all of them back to her own monolingual data. For the second one, I took all of the child's code mixed utterances and I traced them back to the caregiver's data. And for the third one, I took all of the child's utterances and traced them back to the caregiver's data. Now, and here are the results. I hope it's not too small, but they were very similar. Uh, so I wanted to put them on the same slide. So in both of the, this one here is so when the child is the mixed or the child uh, data is uh, the desk corpus is the mixed data and then the child's own monolingual data, then I was able to detect that 31% of the code mixed utterances can be constructed then from the child's monolingual utterances. And also 31% of <laughs> the child's code mixed utterances I was able to construct uh, back or trace back to the caregiver's data. Um, so, uh, and there could not be really any verb at the matches here because uh, the test corpus is the code mixed utterances and the parents did not really uh, code mix. So hence there could not be those matches there. Um, now, uh, looking at when the test corpus is to all of the child's utterances and tracing them back to the caregiver's data, to the child's input data, then um, it was 14% uh, of the utterances were so fixed strings or verbatim matches. So what the child said, the parent had also said, and 38% were those frame and slot patterns. I also looked at uh, most frequent frames and uh, overall uh, I was able to find 477 frames out of which um, 
221 for Estonian frames with an English slot filler and 238 English frames in the slot filled with an Estonian item and 17 were bilingual frames. Um, so, uh, so we can see that uh, at this stage of development, the word mommy or emme are very important for the child. They used, are used a lot. And another one is uh, uh, naming things, or it is, here is, here, where is, that those are also used quite frequently. Um, now, so what I was able to find is that the traceback method can be applied to the Estonian English bilingual speech as approximately the one third of the utterances, I was hoping utterances could be traced back. Um, here, until now, traceback method has mostly been applied to languages that are similar to one another. Um, however, it is also important to note uh, that uh, the method is fairly conservative, because if you think about child spontaneous speech recordings, you're only ever do, you can only capture such a small amount. You only usually the recordings, uh, in my case, they were done about once a week. So you just get a glimpse of their, their speech. Um, Another thing to note is that um, the effect of the flexible word order is not very clear because Estonian has flexible word order, then um, it being able to successfully find patterns shows that it can be applied, but a further in-depth analysis of the traceback fails. So occasions when I was not able to detect a pattern would um, enable to better assess what kind of an effect uh, the flexible word order has. Um, however, there was uh, clearly some interplay of, or play of languages. For example, here, um, there was a situation where the mother and the child were playing this uh, bingo game where you have to match uh, those uh, cards that you take on the board. And the child says, Danti missive also too. So the Danti the, is the stuffed animal was playing too. That misses also too. And then a few utterances later, the child will say, Emme missi kaks also, mommy misses two also. So we can see that the last two words are reversed. Um, and what's also interesting is that, um, <coughs> that uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, here uh, in the first sentence, the, it's in English and the second one, it's in Estonian. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so, but uh, such examples in the data show that um, that it needs to be studied further. For example, that uh, maybe there are some priming effects that are influencing such examples. Um, however, my data also showed that the frame and slot patterns are important in, in the role of co-mixing of our, our bilingual children. So previous research has shown that children use um, co-mixing to communicate better. Um, the co-mix utterances have a longer uh, mean length of utterance and uh, then compared to monolingual utterances. And those uh, co-mix utterances are also more complex. And it has been suggested uh, in the literature that this is so because uh, in the case of co-mix utterances, the child fills those partially schematic um, constructions with highly entrenched words. And, uh, <clears throat> and it doesn't matter what language those words are coming from. Um, it uh, depends rather on the entrenchment of the particular word. So, um, so it can be said almost that uh, uh, that uh, in any speech act of a bilingual child, then uh, words or different uh, lexical units and grammatical constructions, they compete for selection. But the ones that the child um, has encountered uh, so that they have become more entrenched, uh, they're easier to retrieve for this child and uh, faster to retrieve and hence the child is likely to pick those uh, over the ones that are less entrenched. Because um, if you think about a bilingual family, it is likely that some grammatical constructions and lexical units 
are perhaps used uh, more often in uh, certain situations in one language only. For example, if the Estonian grandma comes and visits regularly and they regularly carry out a certain activity in only one language and that activity is not carried out in the other language that those uh, lexical items and grammatical constructions are more entrenched in it. And then uh, the child is likely to pick those over, uh, over the other ones. Um, and also, um, yes, input effects are important uh, because the input uh, balance was also reflected in the language distribution of the frames. So it shows that when the balance, the input was balanced and also um, the output was more balanced. And uh, previous research has shown that uh, uh, in the case of bilingual frames, that uh, uh, their phonological proximity is there, but I did not find any phonological proximity. So I found some of the uh, uh, bilingual frames I found was X on also, X is also, X want this and, and so on. So uh, yes. <coughs> so yes, so, um, in, so in terms of, uh, even though I have some results, then I feel like there's still some things that need to be followed up that I had the finding that it can be applied, but we don't know how much effect uh, flexible word order has and uh, what kind of role does priming have. So yes, um, if there are any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Very much, very interesting. Um, I wanted to say that um, there is flexible word order, or word order for flexible in the school, right? Uh, I guess it's due to uh, lots of infection markers. So, do the infection markers maybe want to play a role in the sense that we do a match it? But then, on the other hand, uh, um, um, you know, you have basically a Pretty even distribution between English frames and Australian frames. So I would have actually expected to have more English frames if we're already going to into the game. Yes. Uh, yes, I did not really think about that, that then there should be more matches. But I think there were just a little bit more, but uh, but not very much, yes. Yeah. But there definitely was such interplay of, of the you know, that the word order was, uh, you could tell that there was something going on, but I it, I did not look in depth into it, but it's probably an article or paper on its own looking at that. Yeah. You mentioned that um, on some days, the parents were speaking one language on another, another. Mm -hmm. Do you find any kind of priming effect or something like this on either, you know, the frames or the slots? That the child used, you know, the choice of languages, was it related to the um, frequency of the language in the input the child received on those days? Uh, so on those days that the child, uh, the frame and slots, uh, ten, or the patterns tended to be, or the child spoke mostly the same language as the parents on that day, um, there was a lot of code mixing. Um, usually, I think most of this day at time, there was about 40 percent of code mixing and then about 40 percent was the language that was spoken in that day and then 10 percent was from the other language and then how would you relate that to the entrenchment hypothesis because entrenchment would normally not i think be related to the kind of local priming type thing right entrenchment is something of the child whereas this is a question of the frequency of the input at the local instance so that could be an interesting trade-off between entrenchment for the child, what is the most likely accessible entity, as opposed to the locally primed things um, that relate to the language that the parents offer. Yes, so that's a very interesting question. And I wanted to look more into priming um, because I, I see things and I cannot explain them quite. And, and that's why I feel like priming and you know, maybe or Salencia has also something to do with, with the choices that the child makes. But yes, those are things that all need to have a study on their own. 
but yes, very interesting points. We have some time for more questions. Which on which day is the kid born? Both kids. So you separate your language by day. Um, so is the kid born when speaking English, which is not? No, it's 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 the same. So roughly the same rate. Yes, roughly. It was actually surprisingly the same and surprisingly consistent. Just a few words about parents. I mean, are they of different languages? Like yes, different languages? the mother or is Estonian and the father is- Balanced kind of- uh, uh, Yeah. Bilinguals? Uh, well, both have learned the other's language and they both speak it, you know, at home, you know, of course not native-like, but it's- And mother is Estonian? Mother is Estonian, father is English speaker. It's a different, well, not a different, but uh, another strategy, like one parent, yes. one language, and then this, uh, you know. Yes, it is interesting because a lot of the studies done are that one parent, one language, or then, you know, minority language at home and the societal language, yes. So it, it's also another dimension that... Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, a little bit ahead of the schedule, but maybe we can let some more time for questions after your presentation. Can I say something to that? Yes, you can, you can start. <laughs> and the next year's presentation is by Ingrid Apalchuniene, Ineta Tatasinskine, and Laura Apalchuniene. You need some help. Just a question, should I uh, find it and open by myself or? It's probably uh, the, the old, old presentations. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you found it. Yeah, fine. Um, <clears throat> okay, I found it. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear friends. Uh, I am very happy and more than happy to be accepted for conference presentation and to be in Thailand again. Mm, if I sit down, can you still hear me well or? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but I, I prefer use mouse, <laughs> using mouse, not, not speak. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my presentation uh, will be in some sense, uh, a continuation of a talk uh, of my colleagues from uh, Vitotas Magnus uh, University. Uh, we had already today uh, in the morning session, um, since I am also going to talk about uh, narrative, narrative acquisition in Lithuanian speaking children. And uh, my presentation um, is just a small part of uh, actually a big uh, project, which was already introduced by uh, Ineta Dabashinskine in the morning session, um, a coordinator of this uh, project. And uh, in that presentation, uh, we studied acquisition of uh, narrative skills from the longitudinal perspective and compared typical uh, and atypical and bilingual children uh, while in this presentation, uh, I will focus on the macro structure and in the only different populations of bilingual children. <laughs> Traditionally, I would need to uh, say some words about uh, narratives and how and why, why do we need to, to study them, uh, why do we need to study macro structure and why uh, should we study pre-primary school age. Mm. But uh, just let me. Okay. But now you can see some answers already on the slide, and slide is also familiar. Familiar. Uh, <clears throat> I just would like to add some words uh, additionally to to what was already said uh, about um, about uh, studies and narrative acquisition. 
Mm, I would like to add that basically uh, in Lithuania, we still lack um, narrative studies in any age group. And especially we need more cross-sectional and longitudinal studies, which would involve not uh, only typically developing children, but also different clinical populations, bilingual populations. Uh, but the main point is that um, oral narrative skills uh, at a pre-primary school age uh, are considered to be pretty well, um, really, really good predictors of later acquisition of um, written, written, written language skills. And especially as a transition from uh, pre-school uh, to uh, preschool or pre-primary school to school age. Or uh, in other words, uh, uh, <clears throat> children who uh, demonstrated better uh, oral narrative skills at the preschool age, uh, they are more successful with reading acquisition at school. And narrative is also uh, considered and uh, recognized to be ecologically valid uh, assessment instrument because narratives are um, mm, relatively easy to identify um, uh, and they are familiar to people of uh, different, I would say, all ages. And what is extremely important uh, is that narrative analysis can tell us uh, much more about uh, language acquisition and language use, um, <clears throat> uh, especially if compared to isolated uh, assessments of phonology or vocabulary or grammar. Uh, because narrative uh, includes uh, everything else. <laughs> uh, so narrative production is a uh, quite complicated and complex process and task. And, and uh, this is valid even for um, subjects without any uh, disorders and, and impairments. On this slide, you can easily recognize, I think, a uh, very fam famous visualization of uh, so-called uh, reading rope model uh, suggested by Holly Scarborough. Um, and originally it was about reading, but I was so inspired uh, of this idea to present so extremely complex system in a maximally simple way. Uh, and I decided to adopt it somehow uh, to narrative uh, and narration process because it's also uh, very difficult, complicated, and as you can see on the slide, uh, consisting of uh, uh, many different components. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> and let me remind that uh, traditionally narrative analysis include, uh, includes uh, microstructural and macrostructural analysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, microstructure was presented already. It's a uh, story productivity, lexical diversity, syntactic complexity, and macrostructure also involves uh, some different variables as, such as informativity, event sequencing, referencing, cohesion, fluency, and, and some more. Mm -hmm. um, in a number of publications, uh, we can find the uh, evidences that uh, in subjects with language deficit, uh, it may be different due to developmental language uh, disorder or um, lang in incompl incomplete language acquisition due to bilingualism or language attrition or whatever, but uh, subjects with language uh, deficit uh, demonstrate um, impaired narrative microstructure. And this is quite predictable uh, since narrative microstructure is very closely related to linguistic variables. But in some other publications, we can find a statement that language impaired uh, subjects, adults and children, uh, demonstrate uh, flaws either in narrative macrostructure or microstructure. And finally, or moreover, <laughs> Some studies in uh, language impaired subjects evidence difficulties with building narrative macrostructure, but not microstructure. Uh, so these data and results of, of uh, previous studies uh, may raise a question about the nature of macrostructural components and uh, their dependency on linguistic skills. 
and or, and uh, of course on um, assessment uh, methodology how narratives were elicited uh, spontaneous or elicited in the what kind of visual stimulus or stimulus were used or no visual stimulus, and etc. Uh, so the aim of the given study was to analyze narrative macro structure um, in three groups of um, children with different language skills, but normal nonverbal intelligence. And we hypothesized that uh, children with limited linguistic resources in, in this case, bilingual children, uh, will demonstrate uh, lower skills in those narrative uh, macro, stru macro structural variables, uh, which are closely related to linguistic uh, knowledge and vice versa, uh, macro structural uh, variables, which are related with cognitive, but not uh, linguistic resources, for example, uh, informativity or event sequencing, uh, they will be similarly uh, developed, developed in uh, all the studied groups. Um, and now some words about a uh, methodological approach. Uh, sorry, Steve had uh, a sample of children um, which was divided in, uh, into three groups. Uh, okay, it's my mistake, okay. Uh, 12, uh, 12 children uh, in each of these groups, monolingual Lithuanian speaking, bilingual children uh, who uh, were speaking Lithuanian as uh, L1 and English as L2, and bilinguals uh, who are speaking Russian as L1 and Lithuanian as L2. And uh, <clears throat> we can see that uh, groups, uh, Groups uh, are different uh, in um, three variables. Um, it's a country of uh, residence, because monolinguals are living in Lithuania, also bilingual uh, Russian Lithuanian speaking children, and uh, bilingual uh, Lithuanian English speaking children, they are living in the United Kingdom. Uh, also, difference in uh, language or languages uh, children use. Monolinguals uh, use only and then you can see uh, already Lithuanian as one English as L2 and Russian as L2 and of course uh, status of Lithuanian language for these children was so different because uh, monolingual children we uh, speak um, uh, Lithuanian as the home language and majority language at school at kindergarten. Um, Bilingual Lithuanian and English speaking children uh, speak Lithuanian only as home language. Uh, and bilingual uh, Russian and Lithuanian speaking children, uh, they speak Lithuanian as only majority language at kindergarten. They speak Russian at home. Hmm. All the children, oh yes, yeah. Hmm. Elicitation. Mm, now we can recognize almost the same uh, picture sequence about a uh, cat uh, story, cat, uh, baby, baby chicks and baby birds and, and uh, dog. Uh, in the previous presentation, uh, another version, the very, very final version was presented, uh, colored, and, then, and here's uh, one of the initial versions. Uh, but anyway, uh, procedure of uh, assessment and narrative elicitation was absolutely the same. Mm, all the children were assessed individually at school or uh, at kindergarten. And during assessment, the child was asked uh, first to look very carefully at some picture sequence, uh, to think about the gist of the story, and then uh, to try to, uh, to tell, think and then to tell um, a story. Uh, during the assessment, what is important, during the assessment, uh, a child could still look at the pictures all the time. Uh, and experimenter did not help, uh, did not ask uh, any questions, uh, um, did not react uh, to any errors, uh, linguistic errors or any other errors of child. And finally, all the stories were transcribed uh, and coded uh, using uh, child's plan uh, for my plan program. Um, 
along with uh, traditional macrostructural uh, analysis and variables such as um, compositional structure, episode completeness, and thermal state terms, uh, we decided to analyze uh, some other variables. And uh, these are listed uh, on a slide. It's topic maintenance, event sequencing, informativeness, referencing, uh, conjunctive cohesion, and fluency. Um, <clears throat> And this uh, methodology, methodology was originally um, developed by Alicia McCabe and, and her colleagues. Uh, and the uh, methodology was uh, originally named the narrative assessment profile. Uh, <clears throat> as authors suggest, suggested, um, a scoring procedure should be rather descriptive um, because uh, experimenter looking at the text of a narrative uh, has to uh, answer these questions. Uh, for example, when scoring uh, informativeness, uh, the experimenter um, has to, to answer, is enough information presented for the listener to understand narrative? Is the narrative sufficiently elabor elaborated? Uh, is the adequate uh, description, action, and so on and so on? Um, if no, then uh, the next question would be um, what specific or additional information does the listener need to understand narrative guest? Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, this kind of uh, descriptive evaluation uh, is extremely valuable uh, for individual language diagnosis or differential, uh, differential diagnosis. But if you have a group of children, uh, or if you have two or three or more groups uh, of children, uh, and we need uh, to carry out a cross-sectional mm -hmm. analysis, of course, we need uh, at least some quantitative measures, not only description. Mm -hmm. so, oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so uh, we decided to uh, do that, uh, additional scoring procedure. Mm, and uh, when we were ans answering the same questions, we just, uh, mm, if, if we could re uh, respond like, yes, uh, we scored a uh, given variable uh, two points. Uh, if the answer would be no, we scored uh, like zero points. And if, uh, if we could say partially, for example, uh, as, as, as uh, answer to any of these questions, uh, then um, this variable was scored uh, one point. Okay, mm -hmm. and finally results. <laughs> Before uh, presenting uh, results, uh, quantitative results, uh, I need to say that we did not reveal any statistically uh, significant differences between the groups. But some differences were at the level of uh, tendency. Uh, so a skill of topic maintenance was the lowest in the monolingual population. And uh, what does it mean? This mean that, um, means that children for, from this group, uh, they produced more utterances, which were not uh, related actually to the topic of the narrative. For example, the child, when he or she was talking uh, about a cat, uh, a cat came, uh, he or she may uh, add and say, well, yeah, I also have a cat, but my cat is a different color. <laughs> and uh, bilingual children uh, do not, uh, did not insert this information, but uh, they could insert uh, clarification questions. Um, here is a cat. Uh, maybe is it, is it a wild cat? It looks like a wild cat. Uh, some such a hesitation <laughs> missions and self-corrections. For uh, event sequencing, uh, we can see that almost uh, like all the groups are uh, almost at the same uh, level. And of course, in the in each group, we had children which achieved who achieved the maximal two points. But uh, here you can see uh, the mean. Mm -hmm. uh, in each group, and uh, the mean is not very high. Uh, again, very similar results uh, between the groups uh, that are revealed for informativeness. And despite between group differences uh, in the linguistic competence, uh, as was already 
no. it was already uh, told in the morning session, uh, informativeness, again, all, uh, almost at the same level and not very high. And the next two uh, variables, um, referencing, um, conjunction cohesion and fluency, uh, demonstrates uh, quite different, uh, quite different uh, results because, um, for example, here, the mean scores uh, for referencing uh, reveal that um, monolingual children are, um, were achieved uh, maximum, maximum, uh, maximal and high uh, scores, um, and we used. Uh, when we had to refer to someone or something, we used uh, noun phrases, uh, pronouns, demonstrative pronouns, personal pronouns. We used uh, ellipses. Uh, is, it, is it usually in prodrop languages? Uh, bilingual children tended to use noun phrases and to repeat these noun phrases, for example. And then a cat came and the cat saw chicks and the cat decided to take them and the cat climbed up the tree and so on and so on. Uh, similarly, uh, conjunction cohesion. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I need to remind here that uh, mm, the most typical cohesion, cohesion devices in the narratives are conjunctions and scores markers. And some uh, mm, words uh, which are formally conjunctions, we can also function as uh, discourse markers. And for this um, analysis, uh, Conjunctions uh, only uh, only conjunctions who uh, function as real conjunctions, not not uh, discourse markers. Markers were taken into account, so we can say that uh, co conjunction uh, co cohesion is uh, highest uh, again in the monolingual children, and it uh, it uh, can be explained. Um, I think it may be related uh, to low syntactic complexity in the bilingual groups. Uh, it was already also presented in the morning session. Um, and uh, finally, fluency uh, was also scored uh, higher in the monolingual group. Uh, in the bilingual group, we found a lot of hesitations, um, incomplete uh, utterances, self-correction, self-repetitions, uh, and many others, other uh, disfluences. Uh, and the most interesting uh, evidence here uh, was uh, different strategies for building a sentence. Uh, when a bilingual child uh, uh, felt that uh, he or she will not be able to um, complete a, a sentence, he, uh, he or she simply dropped it and started uh, from the beginning uh, to, to rebuild it in some other way, simple way. While monolingual children, uh, they tried uh, to complete it somehow as it was planned initially. And of course, with hesitations, with self repetition, self corrections, but anyway, to complete it. And finally, my last slide um, conclusions or maybe take home message because uh, our conclusions confirmed that um, these macrostructural um, <clears throat> variables. Uh, which are uh, related to a linguistic uh, linguistic knowledge. Uh, mm, uh, they, they are not developed uh, as much uh, in bilinguals as much as in monolinguals, and uh, vice versa. <laughs> uh, Macrostructural variables, uh, which are related more uh, to cognitive loading, not not uh, linguistic, uh, they tended to, to, to be at the same level in all the groups. Uh, so we have some results. We have and, and still have some questions. Uh, but since we need more studies in different clinical groups uh, where language impairment can be a primary or secondary disorder, um, these questions about linguistic and cognitive loading uh, may be and should be raised. I think. Of course, this is not a topic of my presentation today, and. I have no more time. I'm very sorry. Uh, in, instead of this, I have to say and want to say thank you for attention and uh, more on the in narrative studies, uh, if you like, from, uh, and open previous publications. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you. if you have <laughs> answer, if I still have a time. Yes. Thank you.
for one question. <laughs> oh, maybe for two, even they are short. No. You, you want to ask? Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, was the uh, gender uh, distribution advanced or was it also could it also be a variable? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question about the uh, gender uh, balance. Well, actually, we tried to keep it, but uh, it, it was not, uh, we are not successful with that because, uh, yeah, we had uh, in, in I cannot uh, say right now uh, how many boys and girls uh, were exactly in each group because uh, in, in one group we had more, a little bit more uh, boys, and in another group we had with more girls, but difference was not very, very significant. Thank you. Yeah, I was curious on your summary, you attributed um, a coherence and reference to linguistic domain, not cognitive. Could you explain why? Just a moment, maybe it's, maybe it's, thank you for a question. Yeah, maybe it's my mistake. I just have the tickets. I have the tickets. If I may start, so uh, because we are co-authors, mm. but uh, I mean, this is because of uh, also in some other uh, authors, you can find that cohesion, for example, is treated as a micro micro level kind of uh, parameter. So it just depends on, on, on your perspective and on your most probably um, uh, uh, also, if you read and you like, and 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 therefore uh, it is uh, uh, mainly also the the kind of choice. But in any case, uh, when when we looked and Ingrida had an idea to develop and to attach it to to micro um, parameters, um, uh, we also had internal discussion that because of kind of this uh, uh, summary, uh, we thought that these parameters are. Uh, Kind of closer to to, to linguistic yes. area, and yes. uh, somewhere in between, I yeah. would say. But if I could argue against that, so I mean, one can see uh, things, but cohesion. When we have, um, so there's the coherence that results from cohesive devices. So on the one hand, you're right that the cohesion, the conjunctions itself, are linguistically manifested, but the result is cognitive. And the same for co-reference. While we have different, you explain that you have the full noun phrase and you have the. Um, there's a difference, so there could be. But then it would be very interesting to see where, like her arguments, that uh, the kind of um, coherence that resulted from the repeat repetition of the same noun phrases that would be linguistically manifested. Whereas, if you talk about uh, the the entity that is being referred to, uh, that would then be cognitive. So it, um, I think it would be interesting to tease that apart one more step to then argue why. I can see where you're going with this. But that would be interesting to tease apart. Yes. Yeah, that's a nice suggestion, yeah. actually. This yeah. is this, this is the, the the way to go and to look at real like uh, examples and then go into details with the data. Otherwise, we have more or less more of uh, 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 frequency distributions and encoding. But uh, this is the way to go. It's mm -hmm. just very fresh material. Very fresh, and our uh, new direction would be uh, descriptive analysis assigned, uh, present according to the knowledge and just uh, have to describe um, verbalization of all of these. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our last presentation is about translation studies and multilingualism. Okay. So this is uh, our title. Yeah, it doesn't work. No, can, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this, you saw what? Can you yeah. show please sure. our title? Just yeah. yes. 
So this is happens when a contact linguist meets a um, so literary scholar and uh, uh, person who specializes in fiction translation studies. And what happens? Uh, uh, well, a couple of words. Uh, do we are preparing a special issue of a, a journal called Metis. So it's a, a literary studies journal, but this special issue is on translating multilingualism. Uh, so this is uh, our outline, multilingualism at the cross cross crossroads of social linguistics, literature studies and translation studies. And uh, we feel that uh, we need a, a descriptive model in order to systematize uh, how multi uh, multilingualism is translated. And there are, of course, some open questions, but um, the main problem is uh, the terminological mess. So, uh, this is the eternal question if there are neighboring disciplines as whether they deal with the, like with the entirely different things or they deal with the same things but that are not identical they overlap partly and but not 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 uh, completely or they overlap completely and we just use uh, different terms in different research traditions so uh, recently, there have been uh, there has been an increase in uh, uh, interest towards multilingualism uh, and uh, language contact phenomena, although they don't call it in that way in literary studies. And so, there are some suggestions. It's quite a, a well-known scholar, uh, Grootman, who says that we should use in when we are talking about. Uh, literary works, uh, you know, fiction and translation of multilingual fiction, we should use a different term and he suggests heterolingualism just before asking ourselves what exactly happens to foreign languages and language varieties in translation, it might be useful to briefly reflect upon their literary use, a phenomena I have labeled heterolingualism in order to avoid unnecessary confusion with real life situations stemming from language contact such as societal bilingualism or diglossia. This point cannot be stressed enough Therefore, I do not share the emphasis sometimes placed upon mimetic qualities of multilingualism. Those qualities do not, in my opinion, exhaust the wide array of possibilities offered by juxtaposition of mixing languages in the literature. And we uh, think quite the opposite. So, because, well, we still think that, well, to an extent, literature is a, a literature, fiction is mimetic. And uh, although literature is not, literary text is not uh, non literary text, so what we uh, use spontaneously in everyday life, still it is based, it's a fictional reflection of the reality. So it dwells upon naturalistic language use. And so it is uh, uh, so, so uh, very seldom it is vice versa when real life language use is based on literature. You can imagine this, but quite often this is not the case. Therefore, why invent the wheel? Reinvent the wheel. Uh, the wheel. We should probably turn to social linguistics and contact linguistics and studies of bilingualism. And we argue that. We can use the same meta language in order to uh, talk about uh, translation of multilingualism. Yeah, so this is a, an old, well, an old presentation uh, mm, uh, given in 2008, yes, by my <laughs> colleague Art Bacchus and myself. And, uh, but uh, the only the, the left part here is from this presentation. So, so, of course, how uh, changes in language happened? Well, contact induced language change. So, there is societal level, so ultimate causes, so social factors that um, 
uh, condition certain language use or uh, condition appear emergence of certain situations where uh, you would use several languages. So this ultimate causes social factors, they do not uh, cause the change changes in uh, directly, but they create the conditions. Uh, and there are proximate causes such as communicative factors, uh, well, linguistic background, goals, uh, etc. And then there was a choice. So you choose what to, you know, uh, whether you use monolingual or bilingual forms. Uh, so, and there are other factors like similarity or, or structural and typological features, and then the mechanisms and results. So you have code switching, borrowing, so many things we were discussing today. And if we add this left part, yeah, we can say, well, it, why not in literature? So the, there, is, there is also the same uh, kind of hierarchy. So there's a societal level, yeah, so real life, uh, yeah. Then this individual level, the writers, the writer decides some things as he plans his or her you know, creation of fiction, uh, so decisions in the process of writing. And then uh, we have this literary text. So the text is never by itself. It's never, or even if we are reading this text, it's never just the text. It has a, quite a long history. Um, so this, graph it may be quite messy but yeah so what we see here so multilingualism in fiction of course we in the right part we can describe we can name this phenomena so, so like code switching or borrowing or non-lexical impacts such as structural changes loan translations or spelling that uh, uh, reflects a different phonology yeah and on the, the, the left part yeah, here, you have uh, the level of uh, narration. So how is may so you can, the writer can conceal uh, the fact of, well, multilingual speech, this is homogenization for various purposes, or provide metalinguistic information. So here the protagonist such and such uh, said this in German, for example, comments on language use in general, now and uh, comments on language use of the uh, characters. Okay, and uh, well, from my part, why it is so important for literary scholarship and why I turn to Anna with this question, how to describe these phenomena, is that uh, in the case of Baltic German literature, that is my field of uh, scholarship, um, we don't have any uh, real language contact anymore. It all happened in the past. We only have the data that is in uh, different kinds of texts and literary texts are therefore really important. And it used to be a um, former colonial power and it has strongly influenced Estonian culture, language, literature, everything. Uh, and now there is a certain interest towards Baltic German literature and people want to see the uh, mindset and, and the habitus that the people used to have. And uh, so every aspect and also especially these uh, aspects of multiculturalism and multilingualism are important for the Estonian readers and it is very sad if th these are uh, omitted. So um, I claim or we claim that uh, Estonian readers turn uh, to Baltic German literature, especially to find these language contact, culture contact phenomena. They want to see their, um, uh, their grand, great grandfathers in these texts as well. So here are some examples how languages are presented, language contacts are presented if uh, there is no code switching. Um, so there are various ways for that. Here, for example, we can understand um, 
in this quote that there is somebody, actually Madeleine was coming from Germany and didn't know Latvian, so uh, uh, it needed to be translated for her. Here it's an emotional moment where the, um, the narrator wants to stress that uh, the, the, the character didn't even know what language was used anymore because um, uh, the, the person was, uh, the character was so uh, emotionally overwhelmed. Uh, and here it's, uh, it's, uh, it's playing with the uh, language hierarchies. And I will come back to that. Or then there are uh, examples of uh, code switching, um, alteration or insertion. Here we have Estonian in uh, German text. And uh, again, we would interpret it as an um, interest towards Estonian because it actually, it, it was published 1934, but it's a collection of letters uh, among Germans. So if there is Estonian in these kinds of uh, texts, of course, we have to interpret it as meaningful uh, in this context. Or here, um, even more interesting, uh, example because in this um, uh, sentence we have a, a Latvian girl but she's using Latvian that is uh, written um, in incorrectly so and and this um, could be interp interpreted as a um, reflection of mostly oral use of Latvian, which was typical for Germans. If they spoke Estonian and Latvian, they did hadn't studied it. They just picked it up as a kitchen language. So it could uh, reflect that, or it could reflect that uh, the writer himself simply didn't know, didn't care, and then um, presents it that way. Or another uh, way, non-lexical, in fact, different kinds of playing with the uh, with, um, German grammar and pronunciation to stress that this person who is speaking here is not speaking correct German. So, and you can imagine that all those phenomena that I have listed now uh, present a challenge when we start translating. Uh, so Anna has um, explained already what what uh, she or how she has described this process, how language uh, contact uh, expresses itself, and now we have the same process all over again. We have the text that is the the object for the translator, but we have to take into consideration that the translator himself also has all these levels of um, influence uh, for his or her uh, language uh, choices. So, and also in the case of Baltic German literature, there is always a, a time shift. The, the texts are translated much later and the hierarchy between German and Estonian in the time of writing of those texts and in the time of translation is completely different. So some examples uh, how uh -huh, okay, and we systematize those uh, um, examples according to Virta Bastita's um, suggestion of uh, um, using these five um, types of, uh, of language um, of translation. So, and I, I will give just some examples, for example, here, how uh, a, a mix of uh, elements of uh, language contact is presented in the original. Uh, first, um, the, uh, there is a um, mistake in grammar in the, in the sentence that is said. Um, I roughly translated it as I not can give the watch. Um, it would be a different word order. 
then uh, he said calmly in broken Russian, so language use gets commented, we, we uh, receive that. And then there is a, a sentence in French, and it's a scene where somebody gets robbed and, uh, uh, and uh, has to um, give his watch away, and, and then he's, uh, uh, um, he wants to express how superior he is to this robber and uh, say something in French which this person could impossibly understand. And so both not speaking the language of the robber correctly is on purpose as also this uh, stressing of the hierarchy of languages in the case of French. So in the Estonian sentence, we have almost the same uh, contacts represented, just uh, the one uh, with incorrect grammar has not been used, but since it's here anyway in broken Russian, this is translated. So we have this information, although it would be more stressed if it had been kept here as well. Um, so um, this, this would be, this is my favorite example, and this is uh, extremely important because in these cases where the otherness is sameness in the translation. So if in the, if that's using Grutman's uh, words, um, in the German text, there is Estonian. And then when we translate it in, into Estonian, of course, there is a problem. What should we do with this? But especially if there is uh, something like here, Estonian is spelled uh, incorrectly. And again, uh, as I said about this sentence in, in Latvian, uh, which was uh, spelled wrongly here, it's the same in Estonian. And it could be theoretically that uh, it's, uh, it's on purpose, that uh, it was oral usage of language and this should represent the oral usage of language. But, uh, and therefore, or if it's just uh, um, arrogance of the writer and uh, she didn't check how the words are spelled, so this would also be meaningful for the Estonian reader. So omitting this fact that Estonian is not presented correctly is uh, actually losing an aspect in this text. And in, in Estonian, we have spelled it uh, correctly, unfortunately, I would say. Uh, but uh, what we sh uh, should still do is go and ask the translators how this uh, happened. And the last uh, example, one more example, um, what, where the translator has used, uh, used quite a good strategy is um, a funny sentence where the, the German e, uh, guy is um, um, presenting how he speaks English. And since it would be uh, written differently in Estonian, the translator adds oral speech in German. Um, transcription, so uh, to make it clear. And things like that should be used probably more often in order to really present this language contact in the text. So this is the summary. So Dear uh, Delabastita has three levels. So, so far, we had discussed only the level of uh, linguistic level, so of the text. But the same procedures like uh, repetition, deletion, addition, or permutation, according to Della Bastita, appear also on the level of uh, well, the, the the work, the entire work, yeah, of the writer, and also or uh, on the cultural level. So, what is the cultural climate? where the text was produced and what is the translation culture, you know, in the, 
the target culture. So because maybe, you know, there are some cultures, translation cultures that do not tolerate multilingualism at all. So they delete everything. Or there are translation cultures that do not tolerate meta texts, so all kind of footnotes, explanations, introductions, um, uh, and so on, and, and uh, the other way around. So, uh, of course, uh, it would be uh, instructive to learn whether a particular translator had a strategy, a clear strategy, how to deal with uh, the rendition of. Uh, multilingualism uh, in the translation. And of course, uh, we have to look at this cultural level as well. So again, as I mentioned, how multilingualism or in fiction is perceived and treated. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. We still have some time for questions. <laughs> Yeah. That was really eye-opening. I hadn't thought about this topic uh, before, and so it's very interesting to see how you tease these things apart. Um, so I learned a lot from these examples. One thing I was missing in terms of uh, literature um, is um, that the question of you distinguishing at which level what happens, but where is the kind of hermeneutic process of that you basically interpret on some background, where I think you could argue that the normal linguistic exchange we've got in the literary language there is a difference there in, and so could you explain a bit where, because these examples were very clear, you say this happens at the linguistic level, at the form level, this happens at the meaning level, what you're trying to communicate, but then this envisioned for the literary writer, they envision an interpretation process of what they want to achieve in, in uh, a reader. And that step seems to be separate and wasn't made explicit. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. If you come back to these levels, uh, of course, there is also this uh, interaction between the writer and the reader and the anticipated or implicit reader that the uh, uh, author has in mind. And that is probably also one of the reasons why uh, there is so little uh, Latvian and Estonian in the Baltic, in Baltic German literature, because they used to write for the bigger German audience uh, German literary market, and they didn't have uh, knowledge of Estonian and Latvian, and it could you, you only be used as a marker of some local localness, <laughs> let's say. So uh, yes, absolutely, this has to be um, considered, and in our article the, we have considered it. But you're right, this, this is important. Article, on the, we're writing an article using these examples, but of course, if you if you take a, a, a different example, so not Baltic German, but, but some other literature, literatures where multilingualism is present because, well, it, it reflects the realities and it will be a very different picture. And also maybe one thing that we didn't mention, but that uh, uh, is quite often uh, is that uh, there are things, there are words used that are perceived today as loans or foreign words or use of foreign uh, foreign language in, in the source text, but actually in this time, like speaking French or, or using French or use, using Russian, or these words were normal and not don't have to be stressed. But sometimes in the uh, translation, they are overstressed mm -hmm. because they are marked as foreign, sometimes in italics, sometimes uh, using the, the loan word and uh, or explaining in footnotes, explaining in footnotes, yeah. but actually it was normal uh, language use mm -hmm. if you compare it with other texts from that period. Mm -hmm. So this um, process needs to be made transparent for the readers. And luckily Estonian readers accept footnotes. So actually it's, it's yeah. <laughs> the truth, yeah. well, because well, this, it is, uh, it's a whole, 
that was a good explanation. Small language, small people, slate modernization, need to somehow to position yourself for, uh, uh, amongst well-established uh, uh, literary languages and cultures. So, so this is, you know, this is how it operates. It's, it's different in a, for small languages, probably. Now, so, so the translation culture, our translation culture loves metatexts. <laughs> One quick question. Very quick question. Is uh, this issue of translating multilingualism is somehow touched in some textbooks on uh, translation? Uh, what students of translation are in Estonia are actually taught to do in this situation? Is this topic even discussed? In and now we have, uh, in our university, we have, uh, well, uh, 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 translation and interpreting, but it, it, I think they have a course, something, they, they, they get something about fiction translation, but uh, uh, mostly these uh, programs are about, uh, well, utilitarian translation, shall I put it, so nonfiction, so I don't know. There are certain rules I think they mostly use that you, you maintain mm -hmm. the foreign language in the case. Yeah, uh, but not, not because, yeah, because it may be quite complicated but sometimes, yeah. you know, in, in if fiction. You translate from German with some inscription of Estonian to Estonian. It's the same what happened when they translate, for example, uh, Anthony Bergen's uh, into Russian. Into Russian. Yeah, but you can mark it, but it, 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 you have to mark it in the, uh, somehow, I think, but uh, on a different level, either metalinguistically, or you can just say that we will use a different script, italics, so, nah. And what uh, happens quite often, for example, this uh, guy whom we had in one sentence speaking uh, uh, German incorrectly, it is translated into Estonian speaking incorrect Estonian. So which doesn't make sense if he was an Estonian or it's possible that he spoke. Uh, he spoke actually. What I I may, uh, saw there, he spoke with an Estonian accent. Yeah, it's, it's so you know, devoicing, devoicing of everything, and you know, and we translate it so you can make it incorrect Estonian. But how? Yeah. Okay. Yep, and it would cha change the the content. So the idea is to present that this person speaks uh, um, German, not. Uh, in a standard way, but uh, it doesn't uh, translate into its mother tongue, that this should also be. Yeah, okay. We have run out of the time. Thank you. Thank you. You know what, place where you could look and notice this um, in Asterix and Obelix. Um, there is very there's a lot of gameplay of with the language, and uh, they so the translators of this and also Lucky 